Yo quiero Taco Bell. On today's show, we are interviewing the former CEO of Yum Brands. You know, uh, Taco Bell, KFC, Pizza Hut. He was the CEO of that organization. However, my interest in David Novak started many, many years ago. You see, back in the day, I was reading this incredible book about how to become a more effective manager and leader. The, the book was titled The Education of an Accidental CEO. And the book was written by the CEO of Yum Brands at the time, David Novak. David Novak, N-O-V-A-K. And the book was just a real page turner. You know, I, I'm a guy who believes that the more you learn, the more you earn. And so I was just flying through this book where David shares how he was able to double the size of the restaurants to 41,000 worldwide restaurants. And he was able to grow the company's market capitalization from $4 billion to $32 billion. And so you can imagine my excitement and nervousness when David Novak agreed to be on today's show. And so I didn't want to waste this opportunity. And so I asked David about everything I've ever wanted to ask him, including how did he go from living in a trailer park to becoming the CEO of one of America's largest companies? You know, people always say, well, how could you live in a trailer and travel around like that? Well, I thought everybody did it. You know, it, <laughs> what's really funny is that even now, no matter how big the house is, when I get together with my two sisters and my mom and dad, who I'm blessed that they're still alive at 90 years old, you know, we, we all sit on the same sofa, clumped up against each other, <laughs> just like we did in the trailer. <laughs> I asked David directly, what are the keys to getting promoted? Early on in my career, I, I really tried to outwork everybody, and I would get in at 5 o'clock and leave whenever I felt like I could leave. I asked David about what kind of behaviors will absolutely kill your path to promotion and will make you an ineffective leader even if you have the job title. Every time you you get to work late, you're telling people you don't respect their time. You don't respect them. And you know what? You just can't do that. People are not going to be motivated by you. They're not going to be following you, follow you unless they can respect, know that you respect them. Mm. And their time's valuable. I asked David, as a manager, how do you correct people who are chronically late? If you let that person keep being late and they work for you, you're doing them a disservice and you're doing the, 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 the team a disservice. I asked David, when running a billion dollar company, how do you keep the team motivated? And so then what I would do is I'd recognize people every time I'd see them doing that. Right? So that really puts fuel on the fire and keeps people motivated because people like to be appreciated for what they do. I asked David about the mindset needed to achieve super success. Be patient, but don't lose your urgency. I also asked David about what kind of character attributes are you looking for in new hires? I, I love people who just can't wait to make things happen. Oh. That have a high sense of urgency. I yes. mean, that's the kind of people I want to be around. Right. Okay? Right. And now, without any further ado, I present to you my interview with one of the most successful CEOs in American business history, David Novak. This is recorded, then I go back and basically edit out my voice so the show sounds good. Uh, okay. All right, here we go. Right. It's confusing. Go. Yeah. All right, three, two, one, and... Get ready to enter the Thrive Time Show. We started from the bottom, now we here. We started from the bottom, and we'll show you how to get here. We started from the bottom, now we here. We started from the bottom, now we here. We started from the bottom, now we're on the top. Touching you the systems to get what we got. Clinton Dixon's on the hooks. I break down the books. Z's bringing some wisdom and the good looks. As the father of five, that's what I'm a dive. So if you see my wife and kids, please tell them hi. It's the C and Z up on your radio. And now three, two, one. Here we go. We started from the bottom, now we here. We started from the bottom, now Yes, 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 and yes. Dr. Z. Yes. We have interviewed the head of Harvard. We have interviewed the, the top Harvard. literary agent on the planet. We the have planet. interviewed Seth Godin. But I don't think I've ever been this nervous to interview somebody. This is the guy who was the CEO of Yum Brands between 1999 and January 1st of 2016. And he grew the business from $4 billion in market cap to $32 billion. David Novak, welcome on to the Thrive Time Show. How are you, sir? 
I, I'm doing great. There's no reason for you to be nervous whatsoever, my he's friend. He's got very sweaty palms right <laughs> um, now. I can attest to it. He's he, quit yeah, wiping I'm them sure. on me, Clay. Quit wiping them on me. He's, your uh, your book was was so good. It, it blew my mind, and I put it on my list. I want to interview this guy about the book, the education of an accidental CEO, because there's so much of your your story that I want to unpack for the listeners. Can you? You've had so much success, but could you share? about your childhood uh, and kind of growing up in, in, a, in a home where your dad was marking latitudes and longitudes on the nation's uh, maps or for the nation's map makers? Well, my dad was a government surveyor, and he was from a very small town, uh, Haddam, Kansas. And my mother was from an even smaller town, Meadville, Missouri. <laughs> but anyway, he, he had a high school education, and the job he got out of school was uh, to be a, a, a surveyor. So you know, we were in a surveying party of about 15 families, and we would move every three months. Uh, my dad would survey the surrounding area, and then the the team would go to the next small town. I'm the only guy you 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 know that's lived in Dodge City, Kansas, twice. Uh, wow. But anyway, my my mother would check me into schools uh, and say, "David, you, you better make a friend because we're leaving." And, you know, it was actually it was, I think, an idyllic childhood because, you know, um, I had such a unbelievable opportunity to be be loved by great parents. And when I played Little League Baseball, the 15 surveying families, they come out and watch me play, wow. you know, and, and it was it was just, uh, you know, it was it was unbelievable. And, you know, people always say, well, how could you live in a trailer and travel around like that? Well, I thought everybody did it. You know, and <laughs> what's really funny is that even now, no matter how big the house is, when I get together with my two sisters and my mom and dad, who I'm blessed that they're still alive at 90 years old, you know, we, we all sit on the same sofa clumped up against each other, <laughs> just like we did in the trailer. <laughs> For awesome. nostalgic reasons, have you gone out and purchased a double wide and put it on your front lawn? Uh, no, not yet. No, that, that may be something I'll think about. Just a, yeah. Yeah. Like, it's it's be like a, yeah. the, the, what is that, the, the Christmas vacation or whatever? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. Don't you fall in love with that, Clark. It's going to be gone in a month. Now, <laughs> now you um, have had massive traction with your with your career, but could you share people the, the your your path to becoming the CEO of a massive company? I mean, how did you start? And just kind of give us an overview of your path. Because I think a lot of people think, if they're not careful, that you must have – uh, you know, had the golden resume and had the, the perfect Ivy League background, and the next thing you know, you're just appointed as the CEO. Sh share, share your path to the top. Well, you know, I got a journalism degree at the University of Missouri, uh, and I was fortunate enough there to really re learn very early that I loved uh, advertising and, and marketing. Uh, so I wanted to start out in an advertising agency, but back then, this was 1974, nobody was hiring, you know, it was a very difficult time, and in the advertising business, they want you to have experience, and I had none. But I did uh, get a job as an advertising copywriter at this little advertising agency in Washington, D.C. called R. Joseph Harrell and Farr. And, you know, it was it got me started on on my path. And, uh, you know, actually, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I had to write. You know, there's nothing more sobering than looking at a blank sheet of paper and you got to come up with the idea. Then you have to go sell it. Right. And, you know, so I got a great appreciation for for getting in the mind of the consumer. And also, uh, you know, I, 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 I really, uh, you know, learned the mindset of advertising agency people and that really helped me throughout my career but anyway i wanted to be in account work so i i decided i wanted to be an account executive so i sent out resumes top 25 uh, advertising agencies the first one to write me back was uh, uh catch mcleod and grove in pittsburgh and i went there to work on the rockwell power tool account and, and and then I decided, I well, I had to go to New York. If you're going to be in the advertising agency business, you better go to New York. Well, I went to New York. I got some job offers, but I felt like a duck out of water. It just wasn't, you know, I grew up in small-town America. Yeah. It just didn't feel right to me. I didn't have an MBA, and, you know, I, 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 I thought that, that people might hold that against me. And, and out of the blue, I get this call from uh, Tracy Locke Advertising in Dallas and to go be the account executive on Tostitos. So I went down there, hit it off with everybody. They offered me the job, and I worked my way up very quickly to be the management supervisor on the Free to Lay account. We had uh, Doritos and Lay's and Sun Chips, and you know I was the the head agency guy at about 28, 29 years old. 
And, you know, I thought I was going to become the president of the advertising agency, but then uh, the, the president of Frito-Lay and the head of marketing Frito-Lay asked me if I'd like to go run marketing at, at Pizza Hut. So I interviewed for that job. And, you know, now I'm running, you know, Pizza Hut marketing. I was the first person they ever hired wow. out of the advertising agency wow. to run a run a, uh, a, a marketing function. And we, you know, doubled the, the, the profits in four years. And then I got promoted to be president of uh, or, or executive VP of uh, Pepsi-Cola Company, uh, marketing and sales. Did that for a couple of years, and I needed to get operating experience. So I begged for an operating job, which I got, and became the COO of uh, Pepsi-Cola Company. And then, then I got, um, I reached my goal. I wanted to be a division president of uh, uh, PepsiCo, and uh, they offered me the job of KFC. Then I ran KFC and Pizza Hut. Was fortunate enough to turn down the CE, uh, the the Frito Lay job, and when they were thinking about spinning off the restaurant, so I was in the right place at the right time to end up running uh, Yum Brands. So I, you know, wow. all these things, you know, I never could have dreamt it. You know, I just did each job, did as well as I could each each time. Looked around and said, you know, who has the job above mine, and I'm going to figure out what kind of skills I need to get uh, the the opportunity to have that job, and that's what I did. Wow. You know, it was, so that's why I think it was. Somewhat accidental. I never, ever thought I would end up running a, you know, Fortune 500 company and the largest restaurant company in the world. And but it turned out to be just a unbelievable uh, American dream experience. Sorry for the long story. No, no, this no, is, it's great. We like it if you make a, a short story as long on this long form podcast. So thank you so much. Seriously. <laughs> we, we, now, uh, as far as um, your work ethic, um, th- I, I know you and I share the same faith, and uh, there's a Bible verse. It talks about working as unto the Lord. Um, you know, we are supposed to not, uh, it's a Colossians 3, 23, 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ you are serving. When you're working in corporate America at a, at a secular company, you're not working at Hobby Lobby or Chick-fil-A or whatever, um, talk to me about how you scheduled your day. And I mean, what, what time were you getting to work? What was your work ethic like? I mean, were you getting there at five in the morning, six in the morning, seven in the morning? Just walk us through uh, your work ethic. You know, it, 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 it varied early on in my career. I, I really tried to outwork everybody and I would get in at five o'clock and leave whenever I felt like I could leave. You know, uh, when I was running young brands, you know, I, I, you know, I went through a process of where I probably got in very early, and then I came in a little bit later. You know, you, I learned that it was very important for me to to get ready to go to work. You know, so I always tried to start the night before. You know, think about what my meetings are going to be, who I was going to uh, meet with, what would a, a great outcome be like, and then you know, I I'd, I'd plan plan for that to happen. Then the next morning, I would get up and I'd think about what I thought about the previous night. And I would do gratitudes. I get up and I write down three things that I'm grateful for every day. I've been doing this for a long time because I think you you need to get yourself into a grateful state. When you're you make your best decisions when you're grateful, you make your worst decisions when you're angry. Mm. So I always tried to work myself up the mood elevator so I could, I could at least be, uh, you know, in that state of gratitude or at least be curious and interested when I went to work. And then I wanted to work out, you know, so that I could stay physically in good shape and have my energy right. So, you know, later on in my career, I actually came in at 9 o'clock. And I found out that people were very happy about that because I really wasn't a great morning person. And nobody really (laughs) wanted to schedule a meeting with me before 10 o'clock. So it actually worked out fine. Um, And I got just as much done. But I was always a guy who, from Monday through Friday, I would work as long and as late as I had to, but then I tried to be home on the weekends with for my my daughter Ashley and my wife Wendy. You know, so even if I you know went on an international trip, I'd try to get back on the weekend, or if it was a two week trip, I'd, I'd try to be back that second week weekend. But you know, that was kind of how I approached things. Yeah, and in page four, on page forty five of your book, you talk about the importance of acting like a leader. What does that mean? I don't think a lot of people wake up wanting to not act like a leader, but we have uh, a lot of people who are, you know, are in our, who attend our conferences, who diligently implement what we teach. And all of a sudden they triple the size of their company. And now they find themselves a leader and they want to act like a leader. But a lot of people haven't led KFC, Frito-Lay, Pepsi, Taco Bell. What does it mean to act like a leader? 
Well, I had a f- phrase that I used, which was be the leader, act like the leader. Um, you know, and, and the idea was that everybody counts. No matter where you're at in the organization, you can take the lead. You can be proactive. You don't have to wait until somebody tells you what to do. Okay? So, you know, so be a leader. Uh, you know, be proactive and then act like a leader. Do it. You know, and, 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 you know, that's, that's what, that's what I thought leadership was all about. Now, obviously, the higher up you go, I always say, you know, there's nothing big that happens by yourself. You have to take people with you. You have to go from me to we, okay? Mm. And and for me, that means, you know, you have to to really get people involved and and you have to have collaboration and 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 you ask, you know, the most powerful way to motivate people is to is to listen to them. And yep. you know, I think that's that's I always tried to do that. And and then I would try to come up with the best solution by getting everybody's input. Now, how did you, um, I guess, imagine you were sitting down next to a, a business owner who's in their 40s, and they said, could you shadow me, David? And something happened where you, you made a few more uh, poor life choices. Next thing you know, you're shadowing this guy. He's in his 40s. He's a plumber. He's got a staff of 15 people. And you watch this guy go arrive late to every meeting. He's late to every meeting. He uh, never has an agenda for anything, uh, and he's just always late, and he never has an agenda. He, he never has a plan. You know, he gets to work right before the day starts. He's reactive all day. What is that tough mentorship or coaching? What would you say to somebody like that? If they're sincerely seeking help, and you've just observed them being late to everything and never having a plan? Yeah, well, I think, you know, one of the responsibilities of leadership is to define reality. So, you know, I think, first of all, people aren't going to listen to you and, until they know that you care about them. So hopefully, if this person was worthwhile and should be on the team, they would know that I cared about them and I had their best interest at heart. Therefore, when I offered them some input about how they could improve or how they could be even more effective, they're going to listen. You know, but I think in a particular case like that, you know, I, I usually try to find out like, what is a person good at? So I can at least start out with, hey, you know what? You're a really good plumber. But you know what? Every time you you get to work late, you're telling people you don't respect their time. You don't respect them. And you know what? You just can't do that. People are not going to be motivated by you. They're not going to be following you, follow you unless they can respect, know that you respect them. Mm. And their time's valuable. So, I, you know, I would, you know, I, I was always very, and I'm still am to this day, very direct, you know, you know I, but I try to put things in, in balance. I, I think you're always better off when you give people feedback to start out with what you appreciate about what they do and then say, here's how you can be more effective. But I think if you let that person keep being late and they work for you, you're doing them a disservice and you're doing the, 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 the team a disservice. Mm. On page 61 of your book, I highlighted the heck out of this page. And then, Z, I know you've got some questions, and so does Charles here. On page 61 of your book, I highlighted this excerpt. You, you wrote, I learned at Pizza Hut that my enthusiasm would only take things so far. Getting people geared up to turn businesses around was just the first step. After that, I had to find a way to sustain the energy and, and, and keep the momentum going. Um, what are your tips for the listeners out there that have a team and who want to keep their team sustainably motivated on a weekly, day-in, day-out basis. How, what tips would you have? Well, number one, I think you recognize the heck of, 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 of all, you know, you recognize people for all the behaviors you know that are going to get results. So I just make it clear, you know, like these are the four or five behaviors that I know that if we do these things, we're going to get results. And then what I would do is I'd recognize people every time I'd see them doing that. All right. So that really puts fuel on the fire and keeps people motivated because people like to be appreciated for what they do. Number two, I think as a leader, you always have to keep defining the unfinished business. You know, you've got to have a healthy dissatisfaction for the status quo. And so to, to me, you know, uh, defining the unfinished business, saying this is, yeah, we've, we've done well, but guess what? We can climb this mountain. We can go here to there. You know, I think people want to be in a high achievement uh, uh, organization. And then, you know, I always really believe you make people realize and feel like they're on the A-team. 
you know, and people don't want to go to work being a part of something mediocre. They want to be a part of, of being something great. So I really like to make people feel like, you know, hey, nobody's going to beat us. We're going to be the best in the world. You know, and 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 let's do let's do great things together. And I think that's how you keep uh, building momentum. Our, uh, uh, David, I want to introduce you to a uh, Dr. Robert Zellner here. Hey, Dr. David. Zellner, I meet uh, David. Um, Dr. Z is an optometrist um, and an auto auctionist, and he owns a bank. Dr. Z, what's your question? <laughs> <laughs> that's true, uh, David. I'm not sure. That's a pretty eclectic background there. <laughs> oh, and, and he goes. Uh, he gave me the short answer. I mean, the yeah. short version. So I don't, I, I don't want to uh, over. Um, estimate tell your what enthusiasm. Else tell no, what else no I'm not going to. Just no, one more thing. Talk about David. <laughs> one more thing. Okay. He's the one we want to talk okay, about. Sure, yeah. So I believe it was under your tenure that you guys started to sponsor the Kentucky Derby. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'm, I'm in thoroughbreds. That's one of my one of my passions. I breed oh, yeah. and race and have them. Can you make a phone call and get my horse in the Kentucky Derby this next year? I mean, do you still have some pull? You know the answer to that question. I mean, I know you could give me some chicken wings pretty fast or a pizza delivered pretty quickly, but can you get my horse? <laughs> uh, uh, let me. I learned very quickly that, that horses uh, e- eat a lot more than they pay. Oh, you know? well, that, amen, amen to that. That's for sure. Um, I, listen, I always like to ask this question. If you could go back 20 years or 25 or 30, whatever's kind of appropriate, uh, you get your DeLorean time machine, fly back and do that, and talk to yourself and tell yourself something. What would you go back? Self. Self. Hi, how are you doing? You're looking good, Self. What would you say to yourself if you go back in time? Well, I, I, I think I would say, you know, always be positive, which I was. You know, make sure you focus on what matters most. Yeah. And be patient. But don't lose your urgency. Ooh, interesting. Be patient, but don't lose your urgency. Yeah, that's like you know, on a you, T-shirt. You, you can't get your ahead of yourself, but right. I, I, I do think you, 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 you know, I don't like people to be. I, I love people who just can't wait to make things happen. Oh yeah, that have a high sense of urgency. I yes. mean, that's the kind of people I want to be around. Right. Okay. Right. But you know, when you're coming up, you know, it, things just don't happen fast enough for you. Yeah. You know, and you wonder if you're going to get there. Sure. But boy, if you stay positive, you work on the things that really matter most, and and you stay patient. The good, the results will come. Okay. Yeah. Um, Just but, like you, you know, that those are a few things. But I'm not so sure I didn't know those things. Yeah, well, it's fun because just like Clay highlighted your book to an obsessive amount, no, I want to highlight ethical. something you said earlier yeah. um, for our listeners out there, and that is. You looked at the position ahead of you at that time in your life. So powerful. And you figured out the skill sets or the skills that you needed to conquer in order to have that job. I thought that was very powerful. I mean, that yeah. was like, wow, that, that alone, I mean, that's, that's like, you know, drop the mic, boom, done. You know, that's a, that was a great deal. And, that, and, and how did you learn that or where did you get that from or why, how did you figure that out? I've always been extremely competitive. Mm, there you go. You know, I, and so, and, you know, I was ambitious. You, you know, I wanted to be successful, you know, and, and I got in the area that I loved, which was advertising and marketing. Yeah. And so I just, you know, I did my job as well as I could do it. And then I looked at who had the job ahead of me. And then I said, do they have something that I don't have? Right. And the answer I convinced myself of was no. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can do what they do. Now, there may be some things I need to learn to do what they do, but I can get that done. Right, and then, right. So I would focus on getting that done, and as soon as I did, I got that job. Mm. And then I'd have another job. Sure. The next job, you know, it's going to be I the head it. of market. The next job, the operations. The next job is president. The next job, CEO. But I just kept looking up and saying, what do they have that I don't have, and then try to try to get it. Uh, I love that. But you have to do your job, the job that you have, before people are going to think about you for the next job. Amen to that. There you go. I love that. See, uh, so speaking of a, a sense of urgency, can we talk about Howard Davis? Yeah. I want to talk about Howard Davis from your book. Can you tell the listeners who Howard Davis was and what, what he taught you? Because that story is fascinating. Yeah. Well, Howard Davis was the, 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 the top guy at Tracy Lock Advertising, and he ran the Frito-Lay account. And I worked for him. He hired me. Okay, I'll never forget it. You know, he picked me up in Dallas, and he had his Corvette, and he was about six foot four, and he wore these glasses, and he was intimidating as can be. Okay, but this guy was 
a make it happen now, do what it takes for the client type of guy, okay? And he had an incredible sense of urgency, and he was tough as nails. And I was a guy who was a really good interpersonal person. I could work well with teams. I could get things. But I needed to get a harder edge. And he taught me that. He taught me how to get a harder edge. He, 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 he taught me how to get, you know, even a higher sense of urgency, you know, and he taught me, he taught me to be tough, tough-minded. And these were things that I don't think, you know, particularly the toughness was something that I really learned from him. The sense of urgency I had, but he was at a whole different level. And I have to tell you, having a sense of urgency in business, and I've met a lot of great leaders, they all have a great sense of urgency. I mean, they're all pushing. They want things to happen now. They don't want it to happen tomorrow. And he taught me that. And I'll, I'm for you know, I write him a note every now and then, telling him what he taught me. Now we have Charles Cola uh, on the show today. There, David. He owns a fitness gym. Imagine like a a uh, Planet Fitness meets uh, Chick Fil A. Okay, it's like okay. a Christian owned uh, large big box gym. It's called ColaFitness.com. They have three locations, and they're in the process of opening two more at the at the moment. Uh, Charles Kola, uh, what question do you have there for for Mr. David Novak? Well, first of all, it's just thank you for having the opportunity to speak with such a a fine CEO that has high character and high values. I, I love that. Um, one thing I was wanting to connect with you on is we're currently, of course, we're in three different states. We've got about 87 to 93 employees. And I'm trying to, to, to continue to keep a good, as a Christian company, we literally like, we really follow a, the core values of Christian values. And I like to keep my teams really connected. And what I'm seeing is that you lose some things as you scale. And uh, some of that a lot, a lot of my staff really like that interpersonal relationship. It sounds like you're a really caring guy, and you've learned how to have edge. And I guess the question is, is uh, we do like a weekly meeting with our corporate team, and then we do a call-in with all of our locations to kind of connect them. Um, and I've seen that as we grow, uh, I feel like they're less engaged at each location. Um, is there anything that you would say, like, we should be doing differently than a once-a-week phone call for a weekly meeting? with like each area location or what, what kind of strategies would you try to use for keeping our teams more connected and more, you know, in tune with the brand and, and mission and vision? Well, first of all, I think, you know, I commend you for having these meetings and communications meetings because I, I really believe, you know, I mean, Sam Walton said it and I couldn't agree more. The more you know, the more you care, you know, so people want to know everything they can possibly know about the, the company. I think the most important thing you can do when you're building a business is make sure you establish what your, your, your culture values are. You know, you know, what are those things that are most important to you? And what's going to drive success and, and results in your, your company? So, you know, I think the culture is the unifying bond that, that, that allows you to get bigger and still stay small. Yes. You know, if you, you can't let everybody in every outlet, you know, create their own culture. You want to have that culture that, that is what your company is all about, and people know it. And then you want to recognize people for the behaviors when you see them. You want to have your HR systems built around these, these, these behaviors. You want to promote people. You want to pay people for really driving your cultural values that you know are going to get the results. I think that's how you really make a big company small, you know, and it, so it's, it's just one of those things where, you know, people talk about culture, but they don't invest enough in it. Right. They don't, you know, and, and, but it's the, you know, I, I studied all the great companies when we were spun off from PepsiCo. I went out and visited, you know, the Walmarts, the Southwest, the Home Depots, you know, all, you know, a lot of the great companies. Every one of them, when you, you ask them what was most important or what was key to their success, they all talked about their culture. Yes. And, and, and you've got to make sure people understand what the work environment is that you want. Yes. And that brings you closer together. And, you know, then when you do all these things, you, you maximize the impact of those meetings because you reinforce the things that make your company what it is. And you, as you get bigger, you've got to make sure that people feel you, okay, yeah. and that you don't become, you know, the so-called CEO. You know, you want to still, I don't know, I forget your first name, but you, you want to be, so, you want to be for, on a first-name basis. You want people to feel like they know you. Yes. And, 
and that's that's really important. You don't want to be Mister Anybody. You want to you you want people to feel like they they know you and that you you can listen to them. David, Great. you 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 have been working on this uh, uh, podcast of yours. There, uh, it's called the David Novak Leadership dot com uh, uh, podcast. They can find it by going to uh, mm-hmm. David Novak Leadership dot com. Click on the podcast button, and you've had a lot of really um, obscure guests. I mean, recently you've interviewed Tom Brady. Um, what's it like interviewing a bunch of uh, uh, people that you know have achieved no success, my friend? I mean, you, you were only able to get Tom Brady on your show. I mean, what's it like interviewing these people? That's got to be exciting. Yeah, it really is. You know, I, I, you know, my passion when I was at Young Brands was leadership development. Yeah. And I taught a, a program called Taking People With You for 15 years to over 4,000 people in the company. So I asked myself, what can I do now that I'm retired? And I, I, I believe what matters most to me is, 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 is developing leaders. So I want to make the world a better place by developing better leaders. That's so great. I started this company. Um, you know, we do blogs. Uh, we have a lot of free content, self-assessments that you can take on, on your leadership ability. And then I do the podcast. I've done – I've posted 83 to date, you know, the Tom Brady's of the world, the, the, the you know, the, the Jamie Diamonds, the Gary Kelly's, you know, great CEOs, you know, great great leaders. And yeah, Jack Nicholas. Because I believe I – you know, when you, when you have access to things and knowledge and you don't share them, you're being selfish. And you know what? I've been so blessed, and I'm the CEO – I've been a CEO. I know all these people. I'm friends with almost everybody that I've interviewed, and you know what? I can bring aspiring leaders experiences that they could never get without without these podcasts, and it's very enriching to me. Now, I also, uh, I have a team, and we've developed content on uh, – we have two leadership programs that we actually sell. One is called Purposeful Recognition. Another is called Essential Leadership Traits. Um, and, but, you know, I'm also working on a subscription based, uh, uh, a model where we can give people monthly insights and, in, and, in, and, in, you know, tutelage on, on leadership. So, you know, but I'm having a blast with it. It's fun. It's my hobby. Um, and, um, you know, it's very gratifying, but it's, you know, I interviewed Tom Brady at, at Foxborough, yeah. uh, during preseason, uh, it, you know, you know, I interviewed Jack Nicholas at, uh, at his house. Uh, cool. you know, I've, you know, a lot of these I do, you know, over Skype or, or zoom, uh, and you know, so it's fun. I've, I just recently did, I haven't posted them yet, but I've got Henry Kravis coming up. I've got David, uh, Solomon from Goldman Sachs wow. coming up, you know, so a lot of, a lot of really talented people, uh, Lynn Dowdy, who runs KPMG, you know, so I but I but I know these people, or I meet them, and then I say, "Hey, would you be interested in doing a podcast?" Next thing I know, I've got them on the show, and I do my homework and I try to make it fun. That is awesome. Well, I, I, th- I thank you so much for your time. I encourage all of our listeners to check out your website again. That's davidnovakleadership.com. davidnovakleadership.com. And again, we just thank you so much for giving us a, a portion of your afternoon. Well, thank you. You guys obviously have fun and do good work, and I especially enjoyed uh, uh, talking to the people who called in. That was It was my honor and my privilege. Oh, well done. And now, without any further ado, three, two, one, boom! There have always been people who don't believe. They don't believe in hard work. They don't believe in responsibility. Ultimately, they don't believe in themselves. They believe in shortcuts, in luck. They believe that outside circumstances control who succeeds and who doesn't. It's just the luck of the draw. But you, you are not one of these people. You believe that no matter what your circumstances tell you, success is still possible. And and you accept this responsibility because you want to achieve something great. You're hungry for it. You, You chase it from the moment your eyes open in the early morning. You chase it into all hours of the night when others have given up, when others have said that it couldn't be done. You've kept pushing. 
because you believe that success is not a game of chance. Success is a choice. A choice that you make every single day. That's what you believe. Discover the world's most affordable and effective business school today at thrivetimeshow.com.